Hello everyone and welcome to another recommends video. In this video we'll be telling Ringworld by Live in Levin. This novel was published in 1970 and it won the Nebula Award in 1970 and the Hugo and Locus Awards in 1971. It has three sequels that we will be getting to in future videos. It takes place in his known space universe. Known space is an area in space surrounding Earth that is about 60 light years across. This is as far as humans have gone so far. So all of the species that are in this story exist within this 60 light year area of space. The reason that most species haven't gone any further is because of the limitation of the FTL drive. It is limited to traveling one light year every three days. And now let's get into the story. Lewis Wu is celebrating his 200th birthday. He has parties going on in several cities around the world and he is jumping into each city using a transfer booth just before it hits 12 in that city and then he jumps to the next city. That way he can visit every party he has going. When he dialed in his next destination, the city of Sevilla, and punched it in, he ended up in an unknown destination with a alien standing looking at him. It was a puppeteer. It had three legs and two heads on long slender necks with its brain in between the both necks and an eye in each head. It had manipulated the transfer system to bring him there because it had a proposal for him. It wanted him to be one of the four members on an expedition it was going to mount. It explained that it stayed behind when the rest of its species fled supernova explosions that happened in the galactic core about 10,000 years ago. They will reach this part of the galaxy in another 20,000 years and at that time the radiation and the wave blast will destroy all life. So they fled but he stayed behind. He wouldn't tell Lewis where the expedition was headed and why. All he did was give Lewis a picture and the picture looked like a star with a hoop around it. The only other thing he told Lewis was that it was 200 light years away from Earth and in the direction of the small Magellanic cloud. When Lewis told him that that would take two years even with hyperdrive, he responded that the puppeteers had a quantum hyperdrive that could travel one light year in one and a quarter minutes. And as payment, he would give the crew the ship and blueprints to build more. So Lewis agreed to go with him. Next, they headed to New York where the puppeteer recruited his next member, a cousin named Speaker to Animals. At this point, he also revealed that his human name was Nessus. Lewis then convinced them to head to his office, which was totally bug proof since the puppeteer was afraid of spy beams. At Lewis's office, Nessus revealed that he's doing this because it will show his courage and by showing his courage, he will perform a valuable service to his species and he would be allowed to breed. So while the puppeteer's agents were searching for the fourth member of the crew to recruit, all three visited one of Lewis's parties. There the puppeteer met and recruited the fourth member of the crew, Taylor Brown, who at first did not want to go but then changed her mind. She was picked because, as the puppeteer said, she's the sixth generation of a breeding program that bred for luck. So the next day they took off from the Australian outback and headed for Nereid, Neptune's moon. Nereid was leased to the outsiders and have been for about 500 years. The outsiders lived in massive city-sized ships that stayed in the space between planetary systems. When they found a system that held potential customers and had a suitable world, they would lease that world for trade centers and rest and recreation areas and supply dumps. It was there that the puppeteer had parked his ship, the long shot. The long shot looked like a transparent bubble that was a thousand feet in diameter. Lewis landed their ship right under the curve of the hull. That's when he tried to bargain with the puppeteer for a better deal. Since the puppeteers were leaving never to return, he asked for the location of the puppeteer home world and Nessus agreed. It was then that the cousin made his move. He had smuggled a variable sword on board and now he was trying to take command of the long shot 
with the puppeteer as his hostage. A variable sword can cut through most metals, but his plan didn't work because Nessus disabled him with a TASP. A TASP is a device that can jolt the pleasure centers of the brain. With enough use, it becomes very addictive, and whoever it's used upon would become a slave to it. Nessus warned Speaker that he will use it on him anytime he feels threatened, so Speaker says he will never trouble him again. Nessus had it implanted in his body so he could use it on whoever he wished. They boarded a long shot. Three of them were put into status while Lois piloted the ship. It took him five days to get eight light hours away from the sun. Then he engaged the hyperdrive. And five and a half hours later, he was at the coordinates given to him by Nessus. He woke Nessus for more instructions and Nessus pointed him to the puppeteer fleet, which was five worlds, the puppeteer home world and their four agricultural worlds. They were moving all of them out of the galaxy. They were traveling fixed into the shape of a Klempler rosette. The puppeteer ship came out to meet them and they transferred over. It was a robotic ship with much more room than they had in the long shot. The long shot was big, but it was mainly engines with very little living space. Once they were settled in, they asked Nessus about the worlds that were being moved. And he began to tell them a little about the history of the puppeteers. It seemed the puppeteers had solved most of their civilization's problems. Food was not a problem. They had agricultural worlds. Living space was no longer a problem because they built extremely tall buildings. The one problem they still had was their civilization's waste heat. So they decided that one way to get rid of the excess heat was to move their planet away from its sun. So they bought a reactionless, inertialess drive from the outsiders and experimented with useless worlds in their system. And then they moved their world. When their population reached a trillion, their sun began acting up. So they found it necessary to light their streets during the day, which produced more heat. So they moved their home world a tenth of a light year away from their sun and heated their world with all the excess heat they were generating. So they really didn't need a sun, only the fact that it would be dangerous for them to go wandering around in space and that they needed their farming worlds that kept them from leaving. So when the sun became a red giant, they placed sources of ultraviolet light around their farming worlds to compensate for what their sun was no longer given. So when the time came for them to leave their galaxy, they had practice. That's when the puppeteers start being a funny species to his listeners. They were probably the most dangerous species around. They moved worlds. They landed on the puppeteers' home world and were taken to a dome where Nessus went off to speak with those who lead while another puppeteer named Shiran came to speak with them. He told them that they knew the star they call EC1752 was ringed by something dense, but they thought it was dust or rocks. But 90 days ago, they got close enough to get a look at it and they realized it was an artificial construct large enough to have 3 million earth masses, that it was habitable and that the atmosphere was about earth normal. He also told them that in the system there's nothing but the ring, no planets, no asteroids, no comets. It would seem that the ring builders either used everything in the system to build a ring and then got rid of anything else that could be a danger of collision with the ring. When Nessus returned, Shiran left. When Nessus returned, he told them that he bluffed his leaders, telling them that if they didn't give him the right to mate, he would withdraw from the expedition as with the Kazin, and they were very upset, but they finally agreed. The hindmost, who is the leader of the puppeteers, accepted him as mate, so all he has to do is return from his expedition. The Nessus led them to an island where the ship was waiting to take them to the ring world. They did this using a more advanced form of the same transportation system that they had on Earth. When they got to the island, there was a specially designed ship waiting for them. They took off and headed for the ring world. It took them a week to travel the two light years to the ring world system. While on the journey to the ring world, Lewis asks Nessus what does the puppeteers know about the blind spot that the rest of them don't. The blind spot is an area around a large gravitational object, like a star or a planet. 
chips that try to operate the hyperdrive within that area disappear. So they must make sure that they're outside of the stars or planet's gravitational field before they engage hyperdrive. Nessus replies that their scientist has proven that their species doesn't have an immortal part. So when they die, it's permanent. So going into a blind spot is definitely a no-no because they're afraid of death. As they got closer to the ring, they saw more details. The ring itself seemed to be about a million miles across and the rim wall was at least a thousand miles high. As they got close to the ring world, they tried to contact it using every means available to them with no answer. So speakers suggested that they land and make contact that way and that thought terrified Nessus. They matched the speed at which the ring world was turning and saw a spaceport. The spaceport was in two parts. A landing pad that held two huge spacecraft, one of which had been cannibalized for parts, and a hatch from which a ship would take off. They flew to the underside of the ring and saw that it was sculpted, showing that on the inside there were seas and oceans and rivers and mountains. They then flew over the open end of the ring, intending to go up and take a look at the shadow squares. The shadow squares sat between the ring and the sun. It was what the builders of the ring used to alternate day and night on the surface of the ring. Otherwise, it would always be in perpetual sunlight. They were then hit by a laser. The laser seems to be an automated defensive system against meteors that may impact the ring. It took off the wing and the spacecraft. Then as they passed between two shadow squares, they were hit by something else. And the cousin went out to take a look and he found that there was a small, thin, almost invisible thread that connected all of the shadow squares together. So the ship tumbles and crashes into the surface of the ring into an area that is a desert. Everyone survived the crash because they were all in status fields. When they exited the ship, they were in the desert and nearby was a massive mountain that was so tall it seemed to exit the atmosphere of the ring. They decided that if there was anyone that could help them repair the ship and get it back into space, they would be at the rim. So that's where they decided to head. They pulled everything out of the ship and unpacked anything that could be useful on their journey onto the four fly cycles. The fly cycles were designed for the three species that were involved in the expedition. They took off and headed in the direction of where one of the rim walls would be located. As they flew, darkness came and they saw the ring world arching over itself. And the higher it got, the narrower it got. It was blue with white clouds and as it got high in the distance it was just a line of blue white at this point nessus freaked out and became catatonic in fear and speaker took charge speaker thought that the port side rim wall was narrow so that's where they headed although it may have been closer to half a million miles away when they had gone 2200 miles nessus woke up. All of the fly cycles telemetry was linked so it only took one person to fly all of them. Lois went to sleep and when he woke up they had traveled 7,000 miles. Up ahead of them in the distance was something shiny. They were headed towards it. Lois noticed that Teela was in a trance so they decided to land but before they could actually land they noticed some natives fishing in a stream so they immediately went straight back up. The natives were men. They were confused as to how humans got there. They found another place to set down out of view of the natives. Once they were down and out of sight of the horizon, Teela came out of her trance. She was in what is known as highway hypnosis. They decided to try and make contact with the natives, so they took off and began looking for them. They came upon a city, a ruined city, and they noticed that some of the buildings were once floating in the air and it seemed that they all lost power at the same time and collapsed on the buildings on the ground. It seems that the power never came back and no one tried to repair the damage. The residents of the city never left. They stayed among the ruins and their garbage was all around. It built up and became compressed over the generations. 
there was one tower that stood at the edge of the city and beyond it was fields that was cultivated. The ground level had risen a good 10 feet burying the original entrance to the tower. Five natives who were obviously the leaders came out of a double bay window on the second floor which was now used as a door. But things quickly went south when the man talking to Lewis punched him. Lewis was much bigger than the man but that didn't stop him and that's when the natives who were watching converged to attack them. They managed to escape on their fly cycles and Lewis had to convince the cousin from leveling what remained of the place. Once they were safely in the air, they realized what went wrong. The natives had turned the ringworld engineers into gods. They had forgotten that they lived on an artificial construct. And Lewis did not give the correct responses that they thought their god should have. Once they were in the air and traveling once again, the Kazin and Lewis figured out something about the puppeteers. The puppeteers had interfered in both human and Kazin evolution. They made sure that the humans won the man Kazin war. They knew that the outsiders followed the starseed. Starseeds are creatures that live and breed in space. So they developed a starseed lure that they put near a human colony. The starseed was lured to go by the human colony and the outsiders followed it. And when they saw the human colony, they made a trade as they always do, giving the humans hyperdrive. And with hyperdrive, humans won the wars. They did this not because they hated the Kazin, but because they knew that the aggressive Kazin would be the ones who would be involved in the war and they would die out, leaving the moderate Kazin to repopulate. The Kazin can now get along with other species, whereas before the war they couldn't, which was the puppeteer's goal. And with the humans, they meddled with the fertility laws of Earth. Apparently, the puppeteers like humans, so they decided to try and improve them genetically. They thought humans were a very lucky species. They have survived atomic wars, ecological disasters, asteroids, and a variable sun, and even the core explosion. So they decided they were going to make humans even more lucky. They did so by using bribery, blackmail, and the corruption of the fertility board to change the fertility laws on Earth. They got them to introduce the birthright lotteries which will eventually make the entire human species the most lucky species to exist. So Teela is the result of puppeteer manipulation. Teela and Speaker were upset that the puppeteers were involved in manipulating the evolution of their respective species. Because of this, Nessus began trailing them at a safe distance. They finally reached the bright spot that they saw from their crashed spaceship. So Speaker went ahead to take a closer look at it. It turned out to be a field of slaver sunflowers. These flowers were designed to be a weapon reflecting the sun's light. They would kill any living thing that came too close. And the injured speaker almost killing him, burning off all the hair on his body and blinding him. Only the fact that there was cloud cover saved them. They dug a little hole and they stayed there until nightfall. Speaker was able to get his side back and heal his burns using medical equipment he had with him. They kept going until they came across a floating castle. The castle was above a city and it was the only building left floating. They could see the ruins of others that had fallen out of the sky. It seemed to have its own power source. Unable to find a way in, they broke a window to get in. The castle obviously belonged to an ancient ruler. Everything in it was large. In the top room of the castle, they found a map room of the ring world and how it used to look. Also at the same time, they noticed that one of the threads that held the shadow squares together came loose when their ship hit it and it was now falling on ring world. And also the city below was inhabited and people began gathering below the castle. It was decided that Lewis would go down and speak with the crowd. Lewis went down and was able to question their priest using the translator. And at the end, the translator stopped translating his words and was saying something else. Turned hot in his hand, he was forced to throw it away. He went back up to the castle. When Lewis got back, he found out that all of the translators had gotten very hot and had to be thrown away. When he contacted Nessus, 
Mesas reported the same thing. So now in order to speak to any of the natives, they would have to learn the ring world language. They made some copies of the maps and then left the castle. Up ahead they saw a hurricane-like storm. But on ring world there shouldn't be any hurricane-like storms. So Lewis contacted Messas and they discussed it. And they came up with the answer. It seems that a meteorite had punctured the floor of the ring world. So they flew into the storm to see if they could find a hole that the meteorite made. And that's when Teela got caught up in the winds of the storm and got separated from them. Teela finally contacted them. She was traveling at Mark 4 and didn't know where she was. And while they were speaking with her, her communications cut out. So they began traveling in the same direction she was going in hopes of finding her. In going after Teela, Lewis and Speaker came to a large city with Nessus trailing them at a safe distance. And as they got into the city, something grabbed a hold of their fly cycles and began pulling them towards a cluster of floating buildings. They were pulled in to one of the buildings and when they got in, they saw that there was many flying vehicles all in that building floating and on some of them were skeletons and on the floor 90 feet below was more skeletons they were in there for some time before they noticed that a woman was looking at them she never said a word she just stared at them and they were in the middle of this room floating with no way to get to safety they called for nessus and he came to them turning off his fly cycle the minute it was captured so that whatever captured him would not burn out his fly cycle engines. Once Nessus got there, he began to speak to the woman using his task at a low level to control her. He had learned enough of the ring world language to communicate. He got the woman to rescue Speaker and Lois. Her name was Halwilo Palala Hutrifan. She used to ride on a ram ship called a Pioneer. The Pioneer ran on a 24-year cycle that covered four systems with five worlds and a ring world. Two of the five worlds had humans on it and those worlds were abandoned and the people moved to the ring world. At the end of her eighth run, when the Pioneer returned to the ring world, nobody answered them. When the crew of the Pioneer found out that no one was answering, they panicked and mutinied. The pilot locked himself in the control room and landed the ship on the spaceport and he was killed for it. There were 33 men and 3 women on that ship and in the end, only 12 survived to live inside of the ring world. While the Pioneer was on a 24 year cycle, that was 24 ship years, while on Ring World, 300 years had passed. Nessus believed that the Ring World fell because one of the ram ships brought back a mold that was capable of breaking down the structure of a room temperature supercomputer that were used in the sophisticated machinery of Ring World. While at first the civilization of Ring World was able to kill the mold, it mutated and eventually one of its variants got hold and spread. It got into the power beam receivers and destroyed them. The power beam receivers received power from the shadow squares and once the shadow squares detected that there were no receivers to receive the power they automatically stopped sending power and since most of the leaders and intellectuals were living in the floating cities once the power stopped and those cities fell most of those people were killed and those that survived were too far apart to be able to work together and what stored power there was was confiscated by warlords who used it for their own purposes. So the civilization in Ringworld fell. So going to the Rim for help was no longer an option. So the survivors of the Pioneer split into two groups. Halo Prilala, called Pril for short, and her group went anti-spinward. When they met a civilization, they would pretend to be gods, and when that didn't work, they would trade the youth drug they had. Eventually, Pril found herself alone until she got to her home city and she took up residence in the downed police station and she spent a long time figuring out how to get the machinery to work so she got it floating once more. There was a system for trapping drivers that broke traffic laws and she turned that on 
and she waited and then she trapped Lewis and his crew. Willow got an idea. They would use Nessus's fly cycle to move the building they were in back towards the castle. And once there, he would get a hold of the fallen Shadow Square wire. On their way, they ran into Teela Brown in a flying car. She had a man called Seeker with her. And Seeker was so old that he remembers his grandparents telling him about the fallen cities. Teela had managed to land her cycle before the speed trap burnt out its engines. And Seeker found her and took care of her. And once they saw the flying jail, they found a car whose engine still worked and went there. Apparently, most people, when they got caught in the speed trap, would turn their engines off to keep it from being burnt out. Lewis now believes that it was Taylor's luck that brought them all here because Taylor was destined to meet Seeker. They got back to the castle and they saw that the shadow wire was lying all over the ground, so close together and thick that it looked like smoke. They landed to take a closer look and that's when they were attacked by the natives and in the fighting, Nessus had one of his heads chopped off. Lewis rescued him and got him to his fly cycle which began to provide medical help. Since the natives had used a shadow wire to cut off one of Ness's heads, and since no one should have been able to touch it, Speaker went out to see how they did it. It turns out that one end of the shadow wire had pulled out of the shadow square. That end had a knob on it, and that's what they were able to use to manipulate the shadow wire. And so Speaker took that end and brought it into the building they now called the improbable and they took off and headed back to the crash site dragging the shadow wire behind them they reached the crash site and they got into their ship they called the liar they put nessus in an auto dock that was designed for puppeteers they then ran the shadow wire into the liar and out the other airlock and back into the building they left prill to operate the airlocks in the liar and they put on the spacesuits, went into the building and floated it up the top of that very tall mountain called the Fist of God. What Lewis realized when he saw the map of Ringworld in the castle was that that mountain was not there. That meant that it was a foreign body that had collided with the ring. Sometime in the past, a very large meteorite had hit Ringworld, burning a hole. It turned into plasma and cooled becoming a 1,000 mile high mountain. And in the mountains, crater would be a hole leading through the ring world's floor. Of course, Teela had stayed behind with Seeker in the castle. So the plan worked. The building, the improbable, fell through the hole in the floor of the ring world, pulling the liar, the ship, with it. Once they were both through, they would be able to use the thrusters on Nessus's fly cycle to get back to the liar and get in and use the hyperdrive to get back to the puppeteer's world. And that's what they did. And the book ends with Lewis and Speaker planning to return once they got an intact ship. This is a book that I recommend people read. It is a classic that stands up quite well. And I want to thank you for watching and listening and give us a thumbs up. And if you haven't, please consider subscribing and leave us a comment and I will see you in the next video.